Welcome to the uh, Future of Globalization Conference, uh, Trade, Finance and Politics. <laughs> and the first session is about the global financial cycles. And uh, we have uh, two speakers. Uh, one uh, first is uh, Professor Helen Ray. And uh, she was the uh, first time I bumped into Helen was, uh, she was a student, uh, European doctorate student, and uh, I was visiting LSE. And I was amazed by her energy. And the uh, second time, she was carrying the big backpack. And, uh, and, uh, and I asked her, where are you going? And she said, uh, I'm going to Himalaya mountain. And, <laughs> and the trekking nearby K2. <laughs> so since then, <laughs> she's trekking everywhere in the world. And uh, today, uh, Helen is going to talk about the global financial cycle. So it's yours. Wow, so that was quite an introduction, Nobu. Thank you so much. I would have never thought you would remember these things. I just noticed that each time I was somewhere, somehow you left. Like LSE, you left. I was in Princeton, you left Pat. <laughs> Probably coincidence. So I'm delighted to be, uh, to be back here and uh, to discuss uh, about global financial cycles and today with uh, you. So I am going to uh, first maybe define uh, what I mean by global financial cycles. So global financial cycles are uh, fluctuations in financial activity uh, measured by a number of uh, variables, which can be credit creation, asset prices, capital flows, leverage, etc., on a global scale. And uh, there's quite a few people who have worked on related issues, um, including Yoon, uh, from a macroeconomic point of view, uh, like me, but also there are some recent works uh, of people looking more at uh, microeconomic data, in particular this paper by Baskaya et al. on, on Turkey. Now, uh, I think it's particularly interesting to, uh, to link the global financial cycles to issues which have to do with financial stability, as we know, there are waves of, uh, of crisis uh, around the world uh, over history. If we think of Reinhardt and Rogoff, for example, uh, history of, uh, of financial crisis, there's a clear bunching of, uh, of this crisis around the world. And also, I think it's interesting to think about uh, the constraints that uh, global financial cycles put to uh, monetary policy makers. So in this uh, spirit, I will develop these, these two points. So the first... Um, the first one is uh, linked to the constraint puts on monetary policy uh, and uh, is really about uh, the dilemma versus trilemma debates. Uh, so I, I've shown in some, in some work that uh, monetary conditions, including uh, uh, spreads, uh, price of risks, uh, but also leverage, etc., are affected by uh, the central country's uh, monetary policy, even under floating exchange rate. So the central, the central country is mostly as you can guess, uh, the hegemon of the international monetary system, which is the, the United States. And uh, this is, uh, so this is uh, going to be a part of, of my talk. But uh, I will start by uh, another point uh, linking uh, um, global financial cycle and global, uh, in fact, uh, booms and busts in, uh, in the world economy. And I will talk about the low real rates period that we are currently in, and I will uh, link that to uh, also to uh, global financial cycles. So on this, I will draw with some recent work I've been doing with Pierre-Olivier Gouracha. So let me start by this, uh, by this second point, uh, which is about this uh, low real rates period and why I think global financial cycles are relevant to understand this, this period of low real rates. So you all know this type of... Uh, of graph which shows a decline in the real rates. This is for the US. Uh, I could have shown similar graphs for advanced economies. And uh, we tend to see these, these graphs quite a lot. We start in 1980s and, uh, and we end up in the period of the zero hour bound uh, that we experienced recently. Now, maybe uh, less frequently, uh, we look <laughs> at historical data. <laughs> Uh, and, and here, so it's kind of interesting, this is the U, again the, the US data, but uh, going back a long way. 
it's always interesting to put, you know, puzzling macroeconomic uh, events in a historical period because we realize that actually things have happened before. And uh, so here we see that we have indeed several periods of low real rates before in history, and in particular, uh, the period around uh, the Great Depression. So in order to uh, look a little bit more at, at the data and to see what, uh, what the data might be telling us about this low real rate, uh, with Pierre Olivier, we have uh, taken a, almost an theoretical approach, trying really to uh, uh, to let the data speak on, uh, and see what it could say historically about this period of low real rates. So we have uh, simply, uh, we started with um, the world budget constraints. So that's a kind of easy thing to start with. So you can think of it as uh, uh, the law of accumulation of wealth uh, for the world, which is a closed economy as far as we can tell. And uh, we have uh, done some very simple manipulation there from the, uh, the budget constraint, the world budget constraint. We have uh, log linearized it, and we have uh, iterated it forward to have an intertuple budget constraint. And what we get is the present value relation that you see at the bottom of this slide, which is uh, relating the consumption uh, wealth ratio uh, of the world. So CT is consumption, WT is the wealth of the private wealth of the world. And this consumption wealth ratio is uh, simply uh, equal to the expected discounted sum of future risk-free rate plus future uh, risky uh, returns. <coughs> this is the, the green term, minus the future discounted sum of consumption growth. Okay, so this is, uh, just to, to recap again, if you, if you do very simple manipulation on what is essentially an accounting identity, you can uh, rewrite uh, the consumption wealth ratio as an expected discounted sum of future real rate, future risk premia, and uh, future dividend growth, uh, consumption growth. So that's the present value relation. Now, uh, we can uh, then use a very simple uh, uh, empirical model, which was pioneered by, by Campbell and, and, and Schiller and, and other people. Uh, it's a simple VAR representation of this present value relation. It's a four variable VAR. And we can see whether uh, this consumption wealth ratio here that we can construct uh, from historical data reflect indeed movements in one of these three variables uh, as predicted by the, by the VAR. Okay, so this is what we are going to see. And from constructing and taking a look at this data and taking a look at the co-movements, we are going to be able to <coughs> say something about uh, what are the determinants of uh, of the, real, of the low real rates that we are currently uh, experiencing, or we are going to attempt to do that. So here is uh, the data on consumption rate ratio uh, since the 1920s for the world, because we are, we are here constructing the world as uh, uh, first France, uh, which is the main component. <laughs> <laughs> and then we added also in the basket uh, the UK and uh, the United States. And, and also Germany. So these are the big financial centers uh, since uh, more or less the beginning of the, uh, of the 20th century. So the consumption wealth ratio of, uh, of that world uh, looks like that over time. So you see that there's some interesting things happening here. We see low consumption wealth ratio indeed in the, in the current period. But we see another period here where there was low consumption to wealth ratio in the world economy. And that's the period which is starting here uh, in the 1920s and around uh, the Great Depression. Now, not coincidentally, uh, during that period, this is where uh, Alvin Hansen started to talk about uh, secular stagnation. And uh, he thought at the time that it was probably linked to demographics. And uh, during that period here, this is where Larry Summers started to talk about uh, secular stagnation as well. So what do, do the data say about uh, what this movement in consumption wealth ratio uh, reflect? Uh, so we, we just first of all look at the fit of the simple VAR that we are running, and we see that this very simple VAR uh, kind of fit quite well. The gray line is, is our VAR. So the predicted is quite close to the, to the data. So we are quite happy about that. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a very simple model. And now what we uh, put uh, here on the graph are these uh, expected components uh, that were on the right-hand side of my, 
of my equation. So we are looking at what is the consumption wealth ratio reflecting? Is it reflecting move future expected movement in the real rates? So the risk-free rates. And this is uh, the red line here. And we can see that this red line is, is tracking very closely the, the blue line, which is the consumption wealth ratio. So the answer is yes. It seems like uh, the consumption wealth ratio is really reflected quite closely the future expected movement in the real rates. In contrast, it's not reflecting very closely expected movement in the risk premium, nor uh, consumption growth, which is this additional dark line here. So you see that the only line which is kind of mirroring the consumption wealth ratio is the, the risk-free rate, the expected component of the risk-free rate. So um, from, uh, from this, uh, we conclude if we, if we take this, uh, as I said, almost a theoretical approach, we see that most movements in the consumption wealth ratio reflect expected movement in the future risk-free rate. That means that if we look at the consumption wealth ratio today, it contains significant information on what the future real rates uh, will be. But of course, nothing is causal in what I said, right? It's purely based on an accounting identity. So uh, all these variables are endogenous and, and they are all uh, interdependent. <coughs> so we have to try to, uh, uh, to put a little bit more of interpretation here. And, and here I, I emphasize we don't have a structural model, so it's the way we are interpreting the data. Uh, if we, uh, we go in, a, in, our, in our work through a number of shocks that may be driving these co-movements across variables, so we, we look at technological shocks and, uh, and, and use very generic types of, uh, of models to see how they would show up, demographic shocks. And what we conclude with is that the most plausible interpretation of, uh, of the data uh, is the following. So if we, uh, if we go back to this... Uh, movement in consumption wealth ratio, what you see is that there are two periods where the consumption wealth ratio <coughs> drops precipitously. This is in the 1920s, and this is in the uh, 1990s, 2000. So these two periods have been characterized by, this is here the roaring 20s. Here, this is the irrational exuberance period. This is two periods where asset prices have been going up very, very steeply. So wealth, financial wealth, has been going up a lot. So the consumption wealth ratio has been dropping very much in these two periods. So these are two periods of irrational exuberance uh, in, uh, in asset prices. And these two periods immediately come before, of course, the two biggest crises, financial crises, that we are going through. So the Great Depression around here and uh, the 2008 crash uh, around here. And they have been followed by uh, periods of... Uh, after uh, this very severe financial crisis, in both cases, uh, periods of uh, deleveraging of, uh, of the financial system. So deleveraging periods are periods where the propensity to save goes up, and, uh, and the real rates is reflecting that by, uh, by being low. So our uh, favored interpretation of the data here is to say that uh, really what we seem to be seeing uh, why are these, low, these real rates low right now? It's because, well, we are, just like there was the roaring 20s, we have been uh, going through the exuberant 1990s, uh, 2000s, where we have had this consumption wealth ratio declining because of wealth increase. These periods have been followed, this is, these are the booms period, they've been followed by uh, large financial crises and then periods of, of deleveraging. So this type of interpretation is consistent with uh, a relatively uh, large literature which is growing, which uh, points to the important role of debt overhang and, and also credit uh, boom and bust dynamics, uh, which has been pointed out by several authors here. Uh, and so we, we, uh, we just uh, point out that at the global level, uh, there seems to be indeed something like a global financial boom bust cycle, and this is in our view what explains uh, the movements in, in the real world. So this, uh, this is, this is not a secular stagnation due to technology or, or, to, uh, or to demographics or anything like that. This is this uh, kind of low frequency boom and bust cycle that we, that we see in the, in the real rates. So this is, uh, that was my uh, first kind of link between the global financial cycle and, uh, and the real rates, which of course put a, a heavy constraint on monetary <coughs> policy if the real rates are low, then uh, we hit the zero lower bound uh, more easily than if the real rates uh, are high. So that's very relevant. 
for, for policymakers. Now, as an aside, of course, you can use this very simple empirical model to, uh, to predict where the global real rates are going. And so here we have, uh, we have done that uh, 10 years ahead. And you can see that uh, uh, we have been predicting that the, so the, the fit is not, not bad. I mean, it's not great, but it's not bad. And you see that uh, we have been predicting that the real rates uh, up to 2021 tend to be low, even though probably uh, starting to go up here. But that's just an aside, just to show uh, what we can uh, do with this empirical model in terms of predictability. Now, um, let me go back to the, uh, uh, the other point I wanted to emphasize about the global financial cycle and to the current period or uh, the, the past crisis that we've been experiencing uh, since, uh, since 2008. So in order to go to, to, to that period, let's take a look at uh, another paper which I've written with uh, uh, Silvia Miranda Agrippino, and where we, the first thing we do in that paper is that we take a very large panel of risky returns around the world, so uh, <coughs> lots of risky, uh, all the risky assets essentially that we can uh, uh, find around the world. So since 1990, we have a lot of, uh, of data, including on emerging markets, on risky asset prices. And uh, in that panel, we test for the number of uh, global factors that could be uh, driving uh, these risky returns. We find that the data cannot reject the existence of one and only one global factor in the, in the panel, in that very broad panel. And that single factor explains about 25% of a variance, which we think is a, is a large amount. Now, what does this uh, global factor in world uh, asset prices look like? So here it is, plotted. As you can see, uh, so we started here. Here, this is a, a narrower panel because emerging markets data is not really available during that period. So I think the most relevant period is the 1990 till uh, the recent period. So we see in this global common component, we see a, a, a run-up here. This was the, the bubble in the, the tech bubble, etc. And then we see another very important run-up before 2008, and then we see the crisis. And I apologize because the graph is a little bit cut there. Now, what we uh, what we do also in, the, in with Cydia is that we decompose that global factor in two components because most finance model classes of finance model will tell us that this global factor should depend on volatility, uh, which is uh, of, uh, of this uh, global volatility, which is plotted here, and an aggregate risk aversion component, which we uh, take from our global factor. So what we see is that uh, the global volatility, if we, if we focus on the pre-crisis period, was very low, as we know, and then it spiked uh, during the crisis. Uh, and very interestingly, the pre-crisis period, since 2003, we, what we see is a uh, is an important decrease in, uh, in aggregate risk aversion here uh, up to the uh, onset of, uh, of a financial crisis. So we see here uh, this, uh, this decrease in, uh, in global risk aversion. Now, during this uh, period, there were some important uh, <coughs> things happening in terms of structure of the composition of the financial system. What I've plotted here, for example, is the share of banking flows in, uh, in total cross-border flows. And as you see, it's a pretty impressive uh, uh, graph when you, when, you see, when, you see this, uh, uh, when you see this, you see that the, uh, the banking flows have been uh, extremely uh, cyclical here and they were uh, growing very fast uh, just before the, the financial crisis. So um, in order to, um, uh, to investigate uh, this uh, global financial cycle, uh, a bit further and to look at uh, the determinants of these uh, uh, both uh, movements in risky asset prices, but also um, uh, in, in, in to look at cross-border flows, asset flows, etc., etc. Et we, uh, we build with Sylvia a large uh, Bayesian VER where we, uh, we have 25 variables in which we put uh, all the usual uh, VR that uh, we would put in a in VRs, which look at monetary policy, that is to say, we look at output, inflation, investment, uh, etc. Uh, but we also put um, the, the important variables characterizing the global financial cycle, such as global credit, cross-border credit flows, financial leverage, etc. Uh, and uh, we look at the effect of uh, U.S. monetary policy on all these uh, these variables. 
So what is interesting about this exercise is that we don't only look at the effect of a Fed on US variables, but we also look at uh, the, the effect of a Fed on all the uh, international financial variables. Okay, so the variables which we think are measures of the global financial cycle. So we do that. We identify monetary policy shock in three different ways. And uh, I'm going to just show you a few uh, examples of what we find here. So this is uh, the usual responses of US uh, domestic business cycle to, uh, to US monetary policy shock. So you see the effect of the Fed on real GDP in the US. Uh, we, you, this is a tightening of the Fed, OK, 100 basis point tightening. Uh, so we see the effect on real GDP, on, uh, on uh, consumption expenditure, on uh, the deflator. So that's the price. We don't have any inflation puzzle or anything like that. And uh, we see here the effect on consumer sentiment. So we have plenty more variables. They, they look, uh, they look uh, the way uh, they should look, I guess, in textbook uh, monetary policy. Um, and then what is interesting is to look at the effect of uh, the Fed on uh, the international variables. So there we look at the effect of the Fed on the excess bond premium measured by the increased and, and co-offer. So the, on impact, it goes up. On the term spread, it goes down on impact. On the uh, global asset price factor, it goes down on impact. And on aggregate risk aversion, it goes up on impact. So this is the effect on global asset prices. I insist this is not US stuff. This is global stuff. And here we have um, the effect, maybe it's, more, it's even more impressive, the effect on the quantities of, uh, of credit. So of course, US credit goes down. But uh, what is more interesting is that global domestic credit, excluding the US, goes down significantly uh, when the Fed tightens. Uh, and uh, cross-border flows, cross-border credit flows, goes down significantly, especially cross-border credit to banks uh, as a result of a, of a Fed tightening. If we look at uh, the responses of leverage, again, uh, we see that US broker dealers' leverage goes down on impact. But very interestingly, also, uh, the euro area global systematically important banks decrease leverage on impact. And so do the UK uh, globally systematically important banks. So again, uh, US monetary policy has an effect not only on the domestic banking system, but very much on the, uh, on the global banks. Uh, uh, this is a way. US monetary policy has spillovers uh, on, uh, on the rest of the world and therefore on the global financial cycle. So uh, let me <coughs> conclude because I think I'm more or less at the, at the end here. Uh, sorry, I had to go a bit fast on a number of, of issues, but uh, presumably we can talk a uh, uh, little bit later if there are things which are unclear. Um, so uh, I try to emphasize uh, two different uh, uh, I think important consequences of the global financial cycle. So one is that it's linked to the uh, uh, to what's happening to the uh, to the real rates. Uh, and to do that, I looked at historical data and uh, and show that uh, one I think the most convincing way to interpret the data uh, is that there are some significant global financial boom and bust cycles, uh, and we have seen uh, you know two of those: one in the 1920s and and one uh, before the. Uh, the last crisis, followed by uh, deleveraging uh, episodes. So during these episodes, we have this uh, irrational exuberance driving down consumption to wealth because wealth goes up so quickly. Then we have a crisis, and then we have deleveraging. And then I've also emphasized uh, the importance of the monetary policy of, uh, of the hegemon, the US monetary policy, uh, in driving uh, uh, these uh, variables uh, reflecting the global financial cycle. So we have seen that uh, US monetary policy is a determinant not only of uh, what's going on in the monetary condition and financial condition within the US, but also uh, in the rest of the world. <coughs> now, uh, the rest of the world, in particular, the Euro area and the UK have floating exchange rates. So this puts in question one leg of the Mendelian trilemma, which says that uh, if you have a floating exchange rate, the floating exchange rate can insulate you from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, external uh, financial conditions. Uh, this doesn't mean, of course, that floating exchange rate and fixed exchange rate are equivalent, but this, uh, uh, this does question uh, the insulation property of uh, floating exchange rate. So in my mind, uh, there is a very rich research agenda, uh, which uh, is around the global financial cycle in terms of trying to understand sources, propagation, amplification mechanisms, endogenous risk buildups. 
And uh, I think we need more models with uh, heterogeneous intermediaries to interpret these, uh, uh, these stylized facts. So as I, as I pointed out, there has been some important action coming from uh, uh, banks uh, and uh, how important they were in the uh, international financial system uh, during that period. And I think we also need to think about models where uh, essentially risk uh, is not uh, very properly priced. So that could mean because there's more hazard in the system or uh, that could be for, for other views. So I think we need to work on, on uh, and this is a very, <laughs> a very difficult, of course, research agenda to pursue. Thank you very much. The speaker is the Dr. Hyun Song Shin. Uh, and, uh, he's the uh, head of research of uh, Bank of International Settlement. And many other things, uh, uh, long career of academics as well as policy maker. He also served as the accountant of Korean Army a long time ago. <laughs> 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 well, thank you, Nobu. It's, uh, uh, and hello, everyone. It's, it's great to be here and see uh, so many old friends. It's great to be back in Princeton. Um, so what um, Ellen and I uh, arranged is that she would speak primarily about financial institutions, financial firms. Uh, or at least the aggregate consequences of financial firms. And I'll say more about non-financial firms and focus more on the trade <laughs> aspect. And um, um, I've uh, given the title International Footprint of Global Firms. And the idea here is that uh, increasingly firms operate globally, uh, even though you know, for historical reasons they may hail from a particular country but they now operate globally, employ workers uh, in more than one country, and this has implications for how we measure activity, as you'll see. So I think this is the way we, we like to do international finance, and it's, uh, <laughs> not only is it very soothing to look at this, um, this, this nice picture, um, this, uh, I think, is a very you know, good metaphor for how we think about uh, international finance, where... Each island is a country, and we measure activity on each island. So we have GDP as our favorite uh, activity measure. And then we have trade across, across islands. Um, and then there are the financial counterparts to, uh, to those trade flows. So we, um, when we do national income accounting, we define the GDP area as our unit of account, our unit of measurement. And then we try and uh, measure the activity on each island. So in the, uh, in the simplest case, if the firms are all located, physically located in, the in, each, um, in a particular island, uh, and the workers are all employed there, the owners also live there, the managers also live there, then it's pretty straightforward to, to actually uh, measure these things, or at least conceptually it is. And then we can think of the balance sheets of... Uh, of each territory uh, in aggregate. Okay. And uh, Nobu mentioned accounting. And of course, Mitch, uh, <laughs> Miss Julius is a great uh, uh, aficionado of this, of this way of looking at the world. And um, this leads very naturally to the current account as our measure of, uh, of vulnerability. So, if, so, the, so the typical story would be if a country is running a very large current account deficit, accompanied by uh, very buoyant consumption. Um, and you know, if it's also financed through banking sector flows, as Ellen showed, then this is uh, um, a typical of a, of a situation which might be vulnerable to a reversal. So if there's a, if there's a sudden stop in the capital flows, this would mean that uh, there is a very sharp contraction in, in activity. And that, um, I think, was... Um, uh, certainly the, the conventional wisdom for uh, emerging market uh, crises. And to some extent, it was also true before the, before the financial crisis as well. And here what I've done is just to um, decompose the aggregate 
um, current account imbalances uh, and split them into advanced economies and emerging markets and show roughly how the, how the balance was achieved. So the, um, the light brown on the left-hand panel, that's the, that's the US. So the US current account deficit was, was very high, the percentage of GDP in the run-up to the crisis. And um, uh, yellow is Japan. Uh, it was running surpluses. The euro area was actually uh, pretty much balanced in, in the run-up to the crisis, although there were imbalances within the euro area. Uh, the euro area vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world was pretty much in balance. Uh, but then on the right-hand panel, you see that uh, the surplus countries were in the emerging markets. So you have China in pink and the oil producers in, in blue. So as a rough approximation, U.S. current account deficits were being financed by current account surpluses from China in China and the, and the oil producers. Now, what's happened after the crisis is that uh, the imbalances have come down somewhat, but the pattern has changed uh, um, quite markedly. You see that uh, now the euro area as a whole is, uh, has gone into a very substantial surplus. And um, uh, the emerging markets um, have, in absolute terms, become, become a much less important. Now, the left-hand panel here shows you the, the kind of textbook conventional wisdom of uh, what would be uh, true if the <coughs> current account balance is indicative of uh, the vulnerability to a reversal. So the left-hand panel on the, on the horizontal axis gives you, the, um, gives, you, gives you the change in the output gap between two periods. So the first period is 2010-2011, second period 2012-2013. And the vertical axis is the change in the current account as, um, as uh, we shift the time period. And we see that there's a negative relationship, which, which is to say uh, when there's a contraction in the economy, you, you see the current account improving, improving in inverted commas. You go from deficits to, to surplus. And you see Spain <coughs> and Portugal on the upper left-hand corner. That's a typical story we, we, we have in mind. And this is also a typical story uh, that applies to emerging market crises. So when a country is running very large current account deficits, consumption is very buoyant, then the reversal uh, would be a sudden stop. Now, after the crisis and, and, um, and during the more recent period, which is on the right-hand panel, there isn't the same kind of relationship there. And nor is there much of a relationship between the current account and the exchange rate either. So there is, um, you would expect a very sharp negative relationship if you think that uh, the current account deficit is going to be remedied by um, a, um, a, a depreciation and a surplus uh, by an appreciation. But in fact, there isn't much of a relationship. And if anything, the blue line shows you that in the most recent period, uh, if there is a relationship, it's actually the reverse. And I think this is a very good cue for talking about global firms. And the, and the idea here is that more and more, um, Global firms, uh, in particular very large firms with a very big footprint, uh, operating with a lot of intangible assets, uh, now uh, have leave their mark uh, um, all over the world. There's a lot of uh, offshoring, which has always been there, but uh, the extent of offshoring has become uh, more prevalent. And uh, there's also the issue of um, the tax the financial operations to do with, uh, do with tax incentives, in particular the redomiciling of both the headquarters and uh, for intellectual property assets as well. And not only do factories and workers have um, a resident jurisdiction, but also assets are also uh, uh, get <coughs> have, a, have a resident jurisdiction as well, and they can move. There's also the financial aspect, and here there's a difference between the income that uh, is paid uh, to, the, to the parent, but there's also the dividends that are paid to the, o to the ultimate owners. And here there's an accounting treatment, which I'll get to, which also causes some, some, uh, some interesting uh, measurement issues. And the first thing is to be straight about what residence actually means in the balance of payments. So um, residence doesn't mean physically being present in a particular jurisdiction. Um, 
It actually is a legal concept that denotes the relationship between an entity, a firm, and a particular jurisdiction. And the particular definition is that uh, uh, it's the economic territory with which it has the strongest connection expressed as its center of predominant economic interest. Okay, so this is the, this is the current definition. This is the state of the art. Um, and uh, the latest um, uh, um, state of the art in the balance of payments is the, uh, is the sixth edition of the balance of payments manual. It's called the PPM6, uh, for those of you who know these things. And it was published in 2009. It was, a, it was meant as an update to uh, bring the, the accounting, the, the national income accounting, the balance of payments accounting, uh, closer in line with, uh, with, uh, with the practice. Uh, but as you'll see, uh, even here, we, we, uh, we see some areas where there is a divergence between what would be ideally what we would measure and how the, how the accounting results um, uh, uh, and how the accounting um, uh, comes down. And in particular, resident in a particular jurisdiction doesn't mean uh, actually physically being present in that jurisdiction. So it doesn't mean engaging in employment or production. And exports of a particular jurisdiction A doesn't mean that the goods actually cross the boundary of A. And I'll, and I'll come to that in a second. Now, domicile is similar to, uh, is a concept which is similar to resident, but <laughs> it also denotes a bit more. It's, okay. uh, it denotes uh, a greater permanence and uh, some notion of the origin of the uh, of the entity, and it has imp uh, it important implications for, for taxation. And um, uh, when a firm redomiciles its headquarters, this not only means that uh, you just change the label, but it sets in motion a cascade of other changes in the, bi in the bilateral relationship between countries that are engaged in the global, uh, in, in the global value chain as well. And, uh, and I'll and let me give you, let me give you a couple of examples just to, just to be a bit more concrete. And I'll give you some, some uh, I'll give you some examples from uh, a forthcoming BIS quarterly review piece uh, with uh, Stefan Abjev, Mary Everett, and Philip Lane. And uh, here we just tackle a few examples. This is not an exhaustive study, not a, uh, and nor is it a very systematic empirical study, but just a, a series of thought experiments just to see what. Uh, uh, what um, kinds of different, uh, what kinds of different arrangements actually happen, and how we can think about them. <coughs> so I suppose uh, <coughs> we can start with this picture, which is the archetypal island's view of international finance. So island A is where um, the workers, the owners, the managers, and the headquarters are all physically located. That's where the production takes place, and uh, the exports of the goods actually cross the boundary of A. And the consumers, let's say, live in island D. And just to uh, make things a bit more concrete, let's uh, just choose these numbers. So um, island A exports 110 units, which is imported by D. And then uh, there are imports going the other way of 60. So there's a trade balance. There's a trade surplus of 50. And that just goes straight to the bottom line uh, to the current account. Now, starting with this initial uh, picture, I imagine that we now relocate, we offshore the production, and we do it in a very much more transparent way by shifting the whole thing to a subsidiary in island C. Okay, so, so island C is where the manufacturing takes place. That's where the workers are employed. But uh, because the, uh, the headquarters are still in A, there will be an income flow that goes from C to A. So this will be the picture here. Um, the exports are now taking place from island C. So 110 is exported from C to D. And then the imports go from uh, D to C. So it's now island C that has the trade surplus. <coughs> but because island C is going to have to remit the profits, um, at least in accounting terms, the profits are accrued uh, when, they're, when they're recognized, and so that's going to be recognized as a direct investment flow okay, to, to A. So all of the trade numbers are now flipped, 
uh, the bottom line is the same. So the character count should still be the same. Now, the interesting thing happens when firm, the firm that was originally in A now redomiciles its headquarters. So you can do this through a corporate inversion, for example, where uh, a subsidiary in, uh, in B acquires uh, B headquarters. Now, what's going to happen here? Well, um, the direct income, which used to be remitted from C to, to A, is now uh, going to C, uh, it's now going to B instead, because that's where the headquarters are. Um, but then B will have to pay uh, the portfolio investors, the ultimate owners of the firm. Uh, and so any dividends will go from now B to A. So in effect, what's happened is that the balance sheet of B has expanded. Okay, so it's acquired some um, FDI assets, but it has also incurred some portfolio liabilities. So it has to pay a dividend to the ultimate owners, but it's also recognizing profits from, uh, from its uh, operation in C. But here's the thing. In, in accounting terms, um, the, the direct income uh, is recognized as soon as the profits are... Um, are recognized on the books. But the portfolio income is only recognized when the dividends are paid. And so what's the difference? The difference is that if the firm chooses to hold back some of the profit and keeps it in cash offshore, then not all the money is going to be paid, uh, paid out. So some of, the, some, of the, uh, some of the unpaid profit could be used for, for real investment, but um, uh, a large chunk will be just kept back and held as financial assets. So if the firm chooses to hold back some of the profit as financial assets, then there's going to be a disparity between the direct investment income going from C to B and then the portfolio income flow going from B to A. So in fact, uh, we're going to be overestimating the income flow going to B. So, here's, so, here's, so here are the numbers. So here... Uh, the trade balance is exactly the same as before. What's interesting is, going to, is, 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 is happening below the line uh, in, the, in the primary income. So the 50 is still going from C to B. 50 is still going from C to B. But because, firm, because the firm holds back some cash and does not pay out everything in dividends, um, the portfolio income flow that goes from... Uh, this, uh, this headquarters now, this headquarters jurisdiction to the ultimate owners is now much less. So what happens is that uh, this island B uh, has a much uh, larger current account surplus than it did before. And island A has a much uh, smaller current account surplus than it would have had before. Now this is a simple case. Um, <laughs> so here's the more interesting case, which is, which is I think... Uh, Probably the more the more important case, uh, and it it um, it's slightly more complex, especially if you combine it with that first scenario. But let me just uh, simplify it this way. So imagine that uh, you have intellectual property assets being owned um, by the firm, and it's very important. It's a very important input into production. Okay, it's the it's the trademark, it's the patent, it's the technology. Um, and so A could be, let's say, um, A. So A could be Germany, and uh, we ha we have contract manufacturing with a with an auto uh, plant in uh, Slovakia or Poland. Uh, or A could be Japan, and uh, C is uh, a manufacturing plant in in Thailand. Or A could be the U.S. and C could be uh, an electronics uh, manufacturer in Taiwan. So there are lots of examples like this where the Offshoring takes place not through the whole the wholesale shifting of the subsidiary, but rather through a contract manufacturing agreement, where the idea is that uh, you pay the contract manufacturer something to actually produce to put the goods together, but then the contract manufacturer then uh, pays you back for the intellectual property, the, the trademark, uh, and uh, all, all the things that go with the with the value added of the of the of the headquarters firm. Now, here's a case where the production takes place in C, and the shipment goes from C to the consumers. But 
According to the definition of residence, um, the economic interest of this firm is in A, and therefore the shipment, the value of that shipment is counted as an export of A, even though the shipment never crosses the boundary of A. And um, I think this is one area. Of, so, 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 so here's one example where um, higher exports may not be directly related to, um, to employment, for example, because the employment is actually happening in C. <coughs> And here, is the, and here is the picture of that. So now uh, all the action is above the line. So, this, so now this example is illustrating, is illustrating what can happen in the trade accounts. So initially, um, we have A being the headquarters, and the manufacturer um, is uh, island C. So all the exports are counted as exports of A, even though the manufacturing takes place in C. But then the... Um, uh, then island A imports goods from both C and D in order to, um, to uh, produce. But then there is the, uh, um, then there is the, um, the intellectual property export. So if you're being paid for the use of intellectual property by the manufacturer, then that's counted as a service export. So that's an export above the line. But then you're paying for the contract manufacturer's uh, uh, services. So that's uh, a service import. So you would have a surplus, trade surplus of 20, and then the manufacturer would have a trade surplus of 30, um, and that sums up to the uh, trade deficit of the, of the consumer. But then everything just evens out in the, in the primary income because then uh, there is the, there is the uh, primary income uh, payment. Now, what happens if um, only one part of the, of the intellectual property is now redomiciled? Okay, because uh, intellectual property assets, they're assets, so just like people, they can, be, they can change residence. And here's an, so here's a case where uh, the intellectual property is no longer owned by the headquarters firm in A, but is owned by the subsidiary in B. And now the contract manufacturing agreement is between B <coughs> and C. So B is a, let's say, a, a financial center that specializes in these, uh, in these kind of transactions. And then the exports are from B to D. Okay. So remember, all the production is, is taking place in C. And in B, this is, uh, this is purely an accounting treatment. So the exports are going from B to D, and the contract manufacturing agreement is, uh, from these, is between these two islands. But then there's going to be the direct investment income that goes as well. So here is where you have this cascade of changes in the bilateral relationships. And you have uh, the, the cascade of changes also being reflected in this table as well. So now all the exports are coming from this financial center. And all the service agreements are between the financial center and the manufacturer. But then everything <laughs> evens out if you take the bottom line, which is the current account. So these two examples, I hope, uh, have, have shown you that it, it's actually possible to, for both the trade and the current account to be influenced very heavily by the activities of global firms. And here is some evidence that, um, that we may have, uh, have seen a shifting uh, towards, um, uh, uh, towards, uh, um, towards some of these features where this is a, a table from the forthcoming DI quarterly review piece where we just took the absolute values of the primary income credits and the primary income debits and then divided it by the absolute value of trade, so imports plus exports. So this gives you, it's to give you a sense of roughly the weight of uh, importance of uh, what happens below the line relative to the trade account. And uh, for all the countries in the sample, we see that uh, from around the early 2000s, it's gone from very close to zero to over 4%. <coughs> so this ratio of uh, primary income payments and, and receipts divided by, uh, by total trade. If we look at advanced economies, uh, that figure is slightly higher. But if we look at financial centers, uh, that's a much larger proportion, something like 25%. <coughs> And it's also true for emerging markets, uh, although the sign will be different, but here we're taking the absolute values. 
And for three countries in particular, um, it's, uh, it's quite an interesting story just to uh, go through the examples for the US, UK, and Ireland, um, and just to see some, some differences. So let me focus on, on the UK, um, uh, given, given, the, given the time constraint. Now, you may remember that uh, there was a debate in the UK about uh, the sharp deterioration of the current account around about the time of the Brexit referendum. And uh, we wondered about uh, uh, whether this would be, you know, whether this is actually uh, the same signal that uh, we would take from, uh, from the emerging markets where a deteriorating current account would be, uh, you know, should be interpreted as being bad news. But actually, if you look at the UK there, the trade account was pretty much unchanged. In fact, there was, in fact, uh, something of an improvement. Much of, the, um, much of the deterioration of the current account has to do with the red line, which is the primary income, the net primary income. <coughs> so this has to do with uh, the direct investment um, payments from the subsidiaries and overseas operations of UK headquartered firms to the UK. And if the firm changes headquarters away from the UK, then the money that was flowing into the UK would go to the new headquarters jurisdiction, somewhere like Ireland. So Ireland is, uh, if you like, the mirror image, where um, because it's remitting a lot of these uh, direct investment income to the ultimate parents, it has a direct investment. Um, uh, it actually has a has a negative net direct investment flow, but it would have been even more negative had um, uh, had some of these. Uh, relocation has not, has not happened. An island is, is, uh, is quite remarkable for one particular number, which is the GDP uh, recorded for 2015. Because in 2015, Ireland had a GDP growth rate of 26%. <coughs> you can see the, the very sharp uh, increase there in the red line. And Ireland has always had this difference between the GDP and and gross national income, because um, uh, you know, there is there's always the, the, the payment that, uh, uh, that, that the firm's resident in Ireland would, would make to its parent. But, they, uh, but the Irish Statistical Office uh, eventually came up with another measure, which had further adjustments. And these all had to do with the activities of global firms. And again, the current account, um, if you take just the raw current account, according to the latest balance of payments manual, showed a huge surplus. Uh, but if you adjust it um, to take account of some of the global firm activity. <coughs> now, this is not to say that this is a perfect adjustment. It is very much a, um, uh, if you like, a, um, an ad hoc adjustment, just to take account of some of, the, some of the large entries. But you can see how much difference that makes. And here's another picture which I think is very revealing. So um, GDP is something that we take for granted as being the best measure of economic of economic activity. But another measure would be something like <coughs> household disposable income, where you see through the corporate activity. And just look at what goes to the households. And household income, uh, and household <coughs> disposable income is defined as consumption, household consumption uh, plus the savings of the household sector plus some um, uh, financial valuation changes to do with the pension assets and so on. If you look at the right-hand panel for the US, <laughs> Uh, which is given by the <coughs> line. This is a pretty stable, it shows a pretty stable pattern. So for the US, um, the relationship between GDP and household disposable income is very stable, but this is not the case for many other countries. And for some countries, um, like Netherlands, Ireland, Switzerland, and the UK, which are above the black line, uh, GDP tends to be, uh, so the GDP to household income ratio tends to be much higher than that for the US. Whereas for the location of the manufacturing centers, like uh, Poland and Slovakia, or for the global firms, you have the opposite. That's the, that's the mirror image. <coughs> so if you believe that household disposable income is the right measure for, uh, for welfare purposes, then you could arguably say that GDP is, being, um, is, is, overestima is overestimating activity for some countries and underestimating for some other countries. Now, let me just skip some of these charts. This is just to show you that uh, the current account can, can actually explain uh, quite a lot of the, um, uh, some components of the current account can explain quite a lot of the changes in the current account, depending on the particular place um, you hold in the global value chain. But let me finish with 
one very important thought, which is I described earlier the profits that are held back by the firm. So how are those profits uh, maintained? <coughs> well, some of it will be uh, parked in bank accounts. Others will be uh, held in, form, in other forms of financial assets. And so, um, um, and so I think we, we, um, you know, we are very used to thinking of non-financial firms as borrowers. But to the extent that uh, these firms now hold a very large amount of financial assets, uh, we can also think of them as lenders. And uh, we, we have to think about how shifts in the financial portfolio of non-financial firms may impact um, financial conditions globally as well. And here are some, some charts just to give you a sense of the, the scale. Um, so the left-hand panel gives you cash as a percentage of world GDP. Uh, so one's a stock and one's a flow, so, so the actual numbers are not so meaningful. But the blue line, which is measured uh, on the right-hand axis, is for the corporate, is a non-financial corporate uh, sector generally. The red line, measured on the left-hand axis, is for the 100 largest non-financial firms. And you see that uh, the pace of increase in cash holdings has been particularly <coughs> sharp for the large um, non-financial firms. Uh, this is also true when cash is uh, measured as a, share of, as a share of total assets. You see that the red line is increasing quite sharply. And we also see some evidence that uh, deposits of non-financial corporates has also been going up um, from our BIS banking statistics. So where does this leave us? Um, well, I think uh, it, uh, it actually... Um, points us in, the, uh, in, in various directions, but I think one idea that, uh, that we could e usefully explore would be to, to uh, try and rethink how we do the accounting for some of these, uh, these, uh, these, these global firms. And one lesson might be to, uh, so one way might be to take some lessons from the way that the BIS has <coughs> measured banking statistics, which is to consolidate at the, at the level of the headquarters and see whether we can think about a consolidated balance sheet of a, of a global firm, uh, just as we do for, for banks. But consolidation is, uh, is not uh, something which is uh, <coughs> easy, or is it, uh, nor is it very obvious as to whether there is, a correct, um, there is a unique correct way of doing it. It depends very much on the purpose. And uh, for the banking statistics, uh, it's relatively straightforward how we do this because uh, they are regulated by a particular regulator in a large jurisdiction. And then it's then easy to consolidate on the basis of where your regulator is. How should we consolidate the balance sheets of a global firm? Should it be based on its historical headquarters? Should it be based on its legal headquarters? Do we actually have to ch change the whole thing when the... Uh, we have to change the location of the headquarters. So w when the location of the headquarters changes, do we then have to redo the whole consolidation? So there are these very um, difficult questions that are, that are raised by this. There are some international, in uh, some international initi initiatives to, to tackle some of these issues, um, in particular on keeping track of uh, FDI and trying to see how uh, firms can be linked through the through these FDI transactions, but um, these are still in its early days. And then there are the financial consequences as well. What of the profit <coughs> that are not? What of the profits that are not um, paid out? How are they kept? And what could be the consequences of shifts in in those cash holdings? So let me finish there. Thank you. Is the time for question and answer? Please uh, raise your hand. Thank you for an excellent talk. Uh, can you please just explain what, what are the consequences of these large cash holdings? Continue. Well, um, so the um, 
So the question is, what are the consequences of, this, of Sorry, this very this large cash holding? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, here we are. So like this one can be out This one can, can also be. So the question is, what are the large? Uh, so what are the consequences of these large cash holdings? Well, um, uh, if they're held in the bank, they're, they're bank deposits. Uh, if they're held in money market funds, they're money market um, um, holdings. But uh, you know they are financing something on the other side of the balance sheet. And so if um, so, you have to, as it were, just uh, trace the whole uh, chain and see um, what are the what are the next steps in the chain? What are the assets that are being financed by that? It's um, so um, <coughs> cash is um, so cash to the extent that they are financial assets will be you know liabilities of someone. So it's someone's borrowing. Uh, so they must be doing something with that. And uh, if these uh, cash holdings shift, then there will be some shifts in the in the assets. Dr. Shin, I have been aware of some of these distortions in the current account uh, numbers as a result of how <laughs> organizations uh, do their business. This looked much worse than anything I'd seen before. And in particular, you've got examples where it moves the line across the current account. The, the examples I looked at, it turned investment income into services income and trade and so forth. And I, but I had thought that the current account balance was fairly Sacred. Now, in your example are these contract manufacturing arrangements. Does that mean that the whole value of what otherwise would have been the export of the manufacturing company gets shifted to the country where the intellectual property is, or only the, the property share? Does the labor share still get booked as an export from the place where the labor was put in? I think the short answer is it depends. Right. So, uh, so I've given you two very simple examples, but typically you would have to mix the two up, and um, it gets very complicated very quickly. Can you give an example, a, a, a real-world example of where this is happening? Uh, well, um, I talked about the German manufacturer, the, the German manufacturer who has a contract manufacturing agreement in, uh, in Slovakia, let's say, or Poland. That would be one example. Um, a U.S. electronics manufacturer who has an agreement with a firm in Taiwan, that would be another example. <coughs> or a Japanese car maker with a plant in Thailand, that would be another example. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can, you can combine, you can mix and match. And uh, what, I, what I didn't want to do was to, was to give you uh, a sense that this was uh, going to undermine whole, uh, it, 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 in, uh, in, a, in a wholesale way, the balance of payments. But these things are possible. And the, uh, the task for us is to you know, try to see through some of them and uh, try to <coughs> get, uh, um, the measurements that we believe are a good match for what we're trying to measure. So if it's domestic activity in terms of uh, workers being employed, production takes place, uh, then some of these uh, measurements that we are very used to may not be a good, may not be a good measure. <laughs> Thanks. I, I, I wanted to ask uh, Helen Ray um, about the definition of cycle that you're implying, because there's a sort of analogy that is implied between the business cycle and the financial cycle. In the business cycle, I think in the kind of classic 19th century or early 20th century books, one understood exactly what led from one phase of the cycle to the next. It had a kind of automaticity about it. But what you have is, in a way, two really massive events that have very, very striking parallels. And you know, I think that's, that's entirely convincing. But you haven't got the logic of what pushes them uh, through the whole phase of a cycle. And uh, I, I wonder whether that's the next of your research projects. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's, very, uh, uh, it's a very thoughtful question indeed. Uh, so this is uh, these big uh, cycles in a way. This is also why are, I, I, I use uh, the word boom and bust as well <laughs> when I when I talk about them because uh, there is this uh, uh, risk building phase and then the, the crisis taking hold and then these very long long run effects of uh, of the financial system uh, uh, crisis which plays out in the real economy. So indeed, uh, now I think the research agenda is to understand better 
um, uh, I think mostly the endogenous build-up phase because I think we have a number of very interesting models that a lot of people have been contributing to which are about the amplification uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of the financial intermediaries, uh, what the, the role we play in amplifying the, fan the, the shock to the financial system and how it uh, leads to uh, uh, effect in the real economy. But I think what we don't have uh, theoretically uh, now uh, in a very well-developed way are models which are able to account for all the features of the endogenous risk build-up phase. And I think this is really where the, <laughs> uh, where the research agenda is, so I'm, I'm indeed trying to uh, to contribute to that, uh, to that agenda currently. Maybe the, I think that the mics are not really, maybe you need to be one, two, three. Yeah. Uh, you need to make it closer. Okay. Just a simple empirical question for Ellen. You emphasize the consumption wealth ratio, and everything went through the consumption wealth ratio, predicting it, tracing it, etc. But if you look at the numerator and denominator, yeah. consumption's pretty stable, and wealth is jumping all over the place. So is it just a, is this just a story about wealth, basically? Uh, the value, the market value. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, uh, in, indeed, I mean, uh, as I as, as I pointed out, I, I emphasize the consumption wealth ratio, but it's like a, uh, it, it's a summary. I mean, it's a summary statistics in a way because it is a, it is an accounting <coughs> relationship that I've been using mostly. So uh, this accounting uh, relationship links the movement in the consumption wealth ratio to this. Uh, uh, expected future movements in asset prices and, and consumption growth. <coughs> now, uh, in the uh, uh, before crisis, there is a lot of action in wealth. I mean, as we have seen, <laughs> and indeed this was maybe the most striking thing about uh, how the movement in the consumption wealth ratio, uh, uh, the volatility of, of this variable <laughs> was really showing up in the before the crisis as this uh, really precipitous drop mm -hmm. uh, due to increasing wealth. So indeed, there's a lot of action there. Uh, through the uh, irrational exuberance. Uh, but uh, then if you look at uh, uh, so what's happening in the, in the aftermath of, uh, of, of the crisis, so we know consumption is not a super volatile variable, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and wealth uh, is going to dominate still some of that movement, but there, there is some action, in the, there is some deleveraging. Now, uh, Indeed, I mean, if you compare the volatility of the two variables, you're right, wealth is, is going to be a very important driver. I, I, I agree with that. Now, to make more progress, we need to uh, flesh out the structural mechanism uh, behind that kind of accounting relation. Mm -hmm. So we go back to this issue about this endogenous risk building and how it plays out and, and how we get the turning point uh, in the crisis. Thank you. Hi. Just... Um, Two questions, and they relate to the financial and economic <coughs> instabilities associated with capital flows and the accumulation of wealth. So let's deal with the latter first, and that's your work, Helen. So number one, is the growth of wealth inextricably linked to the provision of leverage? That is, as asset values start to increase, are the largest balance sheets in the financial system providing the leverage because of the comfort they get from asset values increasing to further the cycle. So you get this reinforcing feedback loop that then causes an overshoot of actual wealth <laughs> versus the leverage. And then you have a collapse as you deleverage and real rates go down because of the overhang, the debt overhang. And, right. and so, so that's the, qu the question is, is your dynamic that you try to outline, I understand it's an accounting idea, related to a leverage factor <laughs> that historically has been provided in different, the leverage provided in different ways, and money center banks particularly, and then crunched in the Dodd-Frank regulation and the Volcker rule, so that maybe you're not gonna have this in the future. So that's number one. Number two, in terms of the relationship to your work and what Hume Shin was saying about capital flows and trade um, and your dilemma trilemma work, does the existence of a global firm require capital controls? <laughs> 
right? So that you avoid, as you build wealth in the system, you avoid the shocks that come from the fact that you got these companies all over the place, and all of a sudden you get this sh cutback in the way things are flowing across these firms, which, so it, whereas right now you have an attenua attenuation, everything is moving nicely, but when you have this overshoot, because leverage is in the system, don't you, don't you attenuate the overshoot by making sure you have capital controls to make sure things don't get out of hand? And is China an example of a country that is exactly trying to do this, have global firms, but limit capital flowing now so that you don't have this crazy crisis in the future? <laughs> So on, on the first question, the link between um, uh, these cycles and, and leverage, and whether indeed you see a, a concentration of, uh, of risk in a large balance sheets, and uh, actors will become very, very leveraged, and then because they are very leveraged, indeed fragile, increasingly fragile, uh, when, there are, when there are shocks. So I, I believe, so I, I don't have historical data uh, detailed enough to, to look at the Great Depression <laughs> for this. Uh, what, uh, what I have done is to look at the, uh, you know, since 1990, where we have data on uh, balance sheets of, uh, of intermediaries, and what you, uh, what you see, and again, this is, uh, this is not a proof, but this is, uh, I think, consistent with the the story of leverage fueling uh, financial in instability and, uh, and this kind of endogenous risk building fa uh, phase, what, <coughs> what you see is that when the cost of funds as measured by the federal Fed funds is low, you see that uh, the large balance sheets uh, are, are, are larger, which means the distribution of leverage across financial intermediary becomes more positively skewed. So you see this negative co-movement between the Fed funds rate and the skewness of the leverage distribution. So that points to the fact when there is uh, this uh, low cost of funds, uh, you have most of this macro risk which gets concentrated in the big balance sheet. Okay, so you see that in the data. I have a graph in a, in a paper that, that shows you exactly that, which points to the fact that maybe if this is what is happening, uh, when you have even a business cycle style shock, you can, you can then have a, essentially the system be, be, becoming unstable and tipping into a crisis. So that would be uh, consistent. Now, we are looking forward indeed because of the change <laughs> in regulation and all that. Right. Uh, the mechanism is going to look like that again. I, I don't know. I mean, in the model, why it happens like that is because the risk taking institution, the most risk taking ones, whichever they are, end up concentrating a lot of a macro risk when the cost of fund is cheap. Now, it turns out in the past, it looked like they were the leverage, the big leverage banks. Maybe looking forward, this is not going to be the case. Uh, and, and, and I don't know, but this is a very interesting thing to, to, to think about. Uh, then about the, I think, the, the capital control and, and global firms, I mean, I, maybe I'll let uh, you answer on the non-financial corporation. And the financial corporation thing, I mean, I've argued in the past that uh, macroprudential policies, okay, to some extent, uh, uh, you know, sometimes uh, are substitutes to, to capital flows uh, limitations right. in order to, uh, <laughs> to deal with financial, with financial risk. Uh, but uh, let me, let me tell you if you know us to. Well, I think uh, you know, even, even a domestically oriented um, policy to limit financial risk taking will, all, you know, will also have an impact on on capital flows too. Uh, and the and the question is, um, um, should there be a focus just on the border, or is it more mm -hmm. more generally um, a question about uh, you know how much um, um, how much you know we want to put in place to to lean against some of the excesses? And I think I think it. It is a combination. I think if sometimes uh, it's the sometimes it's just <laughs> easier to apply the measure at the border. But um, I think that that may be you know, as we as we just just saw, uh, measuring things just at the border may not be the most uh, illuminating uh, perspective. And so, uh, if if the underlying issue is excessive risk taking and excessive leverage, then that's the thing we should be we should be pointing. Now, now it's true that. Uh, uh, the tools that we have domestically may not be, um, you know, may not be fully effective. Um, 
So I think it's um, it's always useful to think about a a pragmatic way of dealing with uh, some of the some of the uh, uh, some of the excesses, especially during the build-up phase. Uh, but um, I think um, uh, I think one thing that we we have learned, especially to uh, you know seeing how global financial institutions and global firms operate, is that purely focusing on the border may not be the right perspective. Dr. Shin, a question we often hear asked, could you help me with this? Suppose during the next 12 months, the current account doesn't change a penny for America. But suppose during that time, in other words, so the cap net capital inflows don't change. But suppose Apple and everybody decides to bring back all their money, repatriate their money. Would that have any effect, net effect on interest rates? assuming fixed portfolio preferences, or is it irrelevant in that the total net capital inflow won't change? So I think this is one very good example where uh, focusing on the border may not be the right perspective, because I think uh, you know, one argument for saying that the repatriation may have an impact is if the cash holding abroad um, were in a different currency, and if you had the, um, had the holdings in financial assets being shifted into U.S. dollar assets uh, and therefore have an impact on U.S. interest rates, U.S. dollar interest rates, that may be one channel. Uh, but I think the available evidence is that even if the cash is held outside the United States, it is held in the U.S. dollar. Yes. So there's a very big difference between the United States versus the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar is much more pervasive than just the within the boundaries of the, of the, of the United States. So that... Uh, uh, probably the, the repatriation um, may have less of an impact than um, if the money were you know, held in a different currency. Uh, but uh, the available evidence is that uh, it is held already, mostly in US dollars. I have a very uh, similar question regarding this uh, uh, Global 100 uh, company. They're holding a large amount of cash. Uh, so, for example, the uh, uh, the offshore account uh, is, uh, for example, is a, for example, in China, uh, they might they might invest through a uh, financial intermediary in Hong Kong, Singapore, or even in London. Then the money invested in the U.S. Treasury bond. So, is this money still count as offshore money, or is it counted into like a, because money is already back into U.S. investing in U.S. either mortgage-backed security <coughs> or uh, core bond and maybe a treasure. So the second question is, uh, does the BIS has any uh, inside information can look into this uh, kind of holding? Like how much do they hold as uh, like a uh, cash or uh, cash equivalent? Or how much do they invest into this long-term uh, fixed income? Or even they invest into like a uh, US equity market? Yeah, I think, I think it's... Uh so for your first question is if the uh, if the Chinese uh, corporate entity holds U.S. Treasury bonds or U.S. corporate bonds in Singapore, would that be counted as offshore holdings? That's correct. Uh, well, um, I think it's exactly the same answer that I just just gave earlier. We have to be very careful in distinguishing the borders of the United States and what's held in U.S. dollars and in other currencies. So the currency and the jurisdiction are very. Uh, different question. So, so to the extent that it's already held in um, in U.S. dollar securities, uh, arguably that's not going. So shifting that onshore is not going to have uh, you know much of an impact um, on on interest rate on on financial market prices. If we saw a very large shift away from a particular currency into another currency, then you know we may see some impact. Uh, on your second question about whether you know we have data, of course we have a lot of data, but uh, we, we get most of our data from, the, from our um, member central banks. So uh, you know, what we have is <coughs> what, uh, what we receive from our member central banks and aggregate um, for the use for everyone here. So it's all, it's all made public. Um, um, I mean, there are some, uh, I think the, the best data tend to be with the, uh, with the supervisors who actually have very, very detailed data. So that kind of data, for particular jurisdictions, uh, I mean, they they belong very much to the to the supervisors in those jurisdictions, not not at the BIS. Uh, 
Okay. Thank you. Uh, two quick questions to Dr. Ling Ray. Uh, first one, you mentioned the possible existence of a dilemma, but you also kind of mentioned in passing uh, the insulation property of fluid exchange rate. Wonder if you can <coughs> comment briefly on the magnitude. And secondly, I might be missing something here on the overall structure of the presentation, a global financial cycle. In the first part, you talked about the component part of uh, consumption wealth uh, ratio uh, and kind of you know how historically the real rates look like and the second part you started talking about the uh, common factor uh, influencing uh, financial conditions globally uh, I think I was kind of missing the link uh, of how particularly the first part of the presentation uh, has to do with global financial cycle thank you thank you uh Thank you very much. So on the dilemma thing, um, so uh, the, uh, we have to start from the trilemma here <laughs> <laughs> to go to the dilemma. So the trilemma uh, essentially uh, tells you uh, in international finance that uh, you cannot have uh, three things, <laughs> which are free capital mobility, uh, uh, fixed exchange rate, and independent monetary policy, and then. A, color, a corollary of the trilemma is that if you have a flexible exchange rate, then you can have an independent monetary policy, even if you have free capital mobility, right? And so the bit of the trilemma so that I'm kind of challenging is precisely <coughs> that one. So I'm not saying flexible exchange rate are the same thing as fixed exchange rate. It's not true, obviously. There are different properties for a number of things, but I'm pointing out that uh, that property <coughs> that the uh, flexible exchange rate is enough to insulate your economy from... Uh, uh, U.S. monetary policy spillovers, for example, doesn't seem to be borne out in the data. And, and, and how do I show that? Because some of the, of the things that I showed you in the second part of my talk were precisely about that, showing the important spillovers of U.S. monetary policy on, uh, you know, the euro area, the U.K., which are pretty much flexible exchange rate areas, important financial areas, and yet their financial and monetary conditions are, are impacted by, by U.S. monetary policy. So that's... So now, how quantitatively important is that? I mean, this is a, you know, uh, we can look at the <coughs> response functions, we can look at the responses of a variable and compare them to uh, what we find uh, uh, as an impact of US monetary policy on domestic conditions and compare them. And uh, the order of magnitudes are not that different. So if one thinks that, you know, US monetary policy uh, <laughs> matters for the US, it seems like it also matters uh, elsewhere. Uh, Okay, so, so that's, but it's, we still need a structural model for that. We would still need more work, okay? But that, uh, that's the empirical evidence that, uh, uh, that, I, that I have. Uh, on the, so what was the link of the global financial cycle with uh, the real rate and all that? So uh, there I, I argued that uh, a consistent lecture of uh, reading of the data, that, that uh, historical data, tells us that the reason why we have low real rates now is because we have gone through a big boom-bust cycle, which is similar <laughs> to the Great Depression. So there, that's a uh, bit uh, what I was discussing with Harald before, the, this idea that uh, this global financial cycle is really a period of booms and busts, which have uh, very important uh, consequences for the, for the world economy, essentially. <laughs> So, all this evidence of uh, you know um, shifting things here and there is, is really uh, uh, fascinating. So, uh, there's uh, also Gabriel Zuckman at, at Berkeley who has been doing this work on relating this uh, kind of shifting of, of flows with uh, tax evasion. And so I was wondering whether this is something you have also looked at. And uh, I mean, we could see in the financial centers that you, you put on, on your graph, uh, within Europe at least, there were uh, quite a lot of places where indeed uh, profit per capita is extremely high. Uh, and, uh, and this is correlated with places where corporate taxation is low. Uh, so is this something that you are uh, pursuing or some, some you know, the, the big shifts that we've seen in the, in the past years? Is it due to structural 
uh, changes in the supply chain, or is it purely a response to tax incentives? Well, I think it's um, uh, so. Tax is an important part of the story, but um, I think it's not just it's it's not just tax, though. I think. Uh, uh, Increasingly, I think we're seeing uh, the the amount of value added um, attributable to intellectual property assets being much being more and more important. And uh, intellectual property assets, uh, unlike um, you know, unlike physical buildings, machinery, I suppose aircraft could move from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but uh, typically you don't see you know factories being uh, being disassembled and then and then moved wholesale. Whereas intellectual property can be moved much more easily, um, and so the so the value added component of the um, of output that is is attributable to these uh, to the to the intangible assets are also becoming larger as well. And so you know tax may be one one aspect, but but I think the nature of the nature of um, of uh, production, the nature of economic activity, is also changing. And I think a very interesting question has to do with um, what uh, what Thomas Philippon has been doing as well, which is on the um, on how the degree of competition changes as uh, as we have more and more of these network effects, and uh, you know that together with the nature of production uh, as well as tax, I think is also part of the story. So uh, it's uh, it's easier to do these uh, to these uh, you know relocations, uh, but the weight of this kind of activity is also becoming Becoming larger. <laughs> it's a combination. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for participating.